Okay, guys, let's get started. Let's get started. This is exciting. This is so exciting on a Monday, I know. I know. Let's get started. Um, today, we're going to talk about causality, and I'm going to tell you about what I call three threats towards causality. But before we get into this, before we get started, let me remind you it is seminar week. You guys, you have your seminar groups. You have to go there. Remember, it is mandatory. It sums up to uh, your final grades. So go to your seminar group. They take place at uh, different times. You all figured it out. You all know where you are. You all know where you have to go. Unless you receive an email from us, which means you need to go somewhere else. But if you don't receive an email, don't worry. You go to G6 in the database building. Okay. I promise that I'm going to ask you exactly the same question that we had last time. So um, take out your phones, your tablets, whatever you have. Put away this Instagram feed of yours and Twitter accounts and answer the question. Okay, guys, this is looking good. This is looking good. The important point is a spurious effect means no causal relationship. No causal relationship. And I will talk about that in today's lecture. But what it means on the other things, um, a spurious effect, there's no causal relationship between X and Y. It also means there is uh, an association between X and Y. Last time, we had... Last time, this is what you guys said. So there were more people saying that it's a causal relationship. Now there are less people. I hope that at the end of this lecture, there's going to be nobody who's going to say that. Right. Okay, the next question that I have. This is sort of now not about um, a spurious relationship, but about something else. Okay, who are the 15 who said there's neither of the previous two? Hands up. You guys are correct. You guys are correct. Most of us are incorrect. Most of us are incorrect. Why? What does 50% mean here? 
I don't know, what, what are we comparing this against? Right? So we need to have a, a, a comparison to say something like that, that there is an association between the one and the other. Maybe, maybe, and I'm going to have an example about that, maybe unemployment rate is 50% among everybody. Maybe it's 50%, that's the youth unemployment in general. Right? So actually what you observed here, this statement was a coincidence, but not an association. That's sort of the key thing here. And that's, there you actually notice, you know, this is, you guys, you know, you're all clever, you're interested in social sciences, and you haven't hear about that. Now imagine all those people who, I don't know, who write about this stuff in the media, in the news, and, and they, they have even less education than you guys. They make this mistake all the time. They make this mistake all the time to take coincidence for association or correlation, or even worse than causation. But we're going to come back to that and hopefully at the end of this course, of this lecture, you will all understand why this is just a coincidence and not an association or a correlation. So we need to know what we are comparing things against with. So let me just first hammer out some stuff uh, about your know, coincidence, association, correlation, and causation that we know what we are talking about. Well, first of all, we have this coincidence. Yeah? Coincidence means that two things, X and Y, just happen at the same time. Now that's like, a, like an eclipse, right? So there's the moon in front of the sun, right? And you look at it, and if you, if you were, I don't know, a few hundred years back, you would have thought, oh, we did something wrong. We didn't, we didn't praise God enough. Uh, this is sort of the wrath of, uh, of God. We, uh, we are doomed, right? But what it was, it was a coincidence. Uh, and as you will see, some things just happen. Some things just happen just by chance. Right? And I'm going to have some examples about that, where you hopefully get this point that when two things happen together, you always need to be thinking about, is this something that might have just happened by chance? And some things just will happen by chance. Right? Okay, a coincidence, there's no statement about change. All right? That was sort of the important thing in this statement I had about you know, the 50%. Uh, um, so here I have the statement again, 50% you know, of people who commit suicide are unemployed. Another statement, private schools produce high academic performance among their students. Or the third one, children with divorced parents have emotional problems. All of these three statements, they don't tell you very much. They don't tell you very much at all. Unless you combine it with some additional knowledge that you have, right? I don't know, maybe you know, uh, maybe you have a feeling for what the unemployment rate is, or maybe you have a feeling for uh, what is the, 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 the achievement of students from, from government or public schools. But without these additional information, these statements don't tell you anything. They don't tell you anything. And that's sort of the kind of stuff, you know, I sometimes read in, in bachelor thesis or master's students, and I wonder, okay, what do you tell me? Why? Well, maybe unemployment rate is 50% among the youth in general. In the second case, maybe government schools produce high academic performance among their students as well. Or in the third case, maybe children with non-divorced parents have emotional problems as well. So you already, you see how easy it is, how easy it is to get into this trap where we think that stuff is related with each other or where we even make a causal relationship and say that this, is, this causes X causes Y, but in fact it might not be the case at all. Right? And you see how sort of this is actually really important. It's our job, it's our job to, to think about that clearly and correct people who make these mistakes because this could lead to, to implications, to, co to conclusions that are being drawn based on statements made in such a way. Okay, so that's coincidence. <coughs> Things happen together at the same time. It doesn't, mean that they, it doesn't even mean that they are necessarily associated with each other, right? Or that there's a causal relationship. The next thing is an association. Yeah, you've been seeing me using this term here and there a little bit. And association essentially means that two variables, x and y, when you change the one, the other one changes as well. That's sort of the thing. And you see, this is already different from the stuff that we had before. Right? This is sort of different from the coincidence thing. Some other things, you know, there's no functional form here. Don't worry about that. No magnitude specified. It's not clear how strong, how much do you change one thing, and how much does this affect then the other one. It's not clearly specified here, and there's also no causality specified here. We just say the two things, when you change the one thing, the other one changes as well. And now bringing back these examples that I had, you know, now, now there's a little more meaning in these sentences here. Now I'm saying 50% of young people who commit suicide are unemployed, and unemployment is much lower among those who do not commit suicide. You already see, now, now I established the association here in this sentence. But before, I did not. Right? So now I rule out this, this, this alternative that, that uh, unemployment is high amongst everybody. 
Private schools have higher levels of academic performance among their students than government schools. <coughs> children of divorced parents show more emotional problems than children from non-divorced parents. And that's sort of the kind of statements that we want to do. So when you, when you design your study, don't do the first study. Yeah, coincidence, that's just, um, uh, it, it, you could show everything with coincidence, and I have an example for that. So we want to get into the associations, right? We want to know about, okay, when we change the one thing, how does the other one change? And actually, we, we even want to know more. We want to know how much does the other thing change when we change one thing. And that's what we call correlation. We're going to get to that later on in this course, towards the end, about how to calculate these kind of things. But correlation is essentially a particular kind of association, yeah, where changes in x go along with changes in y. And the correlation assumes a linear relationship. So now you see some, some data points, you know, we have some observations, there's some information on the x-axis and some information on the y-axis, and then we see a correlation kind of measures the degree to which uh, there is a, a, a line going through that and uh, what is the slope of this line. And then correlation, but we come back to that, correlation ranges essentially from minus one to plus one, you know, zero means no correlation, minus one means negative correlation, and uh, one plus one means positive correlation. And then there are sort of values in between that gives you something about the magnitude of that. Right. Essentially, a positive correlation of one means when you increase x by one unit, y goes up by one unit. That's sort of the, the, the thing. While a negative correlation of minus one means that if you increase x by one unit, y goes down by one unit. Okay, but the core point here is, now we're, we're moving closer towards this causality thing. You know, that's sort of what we try to think about how we know stuff and we try to explain stuff and we want to think, make about uh, trying to understand this world and often what we see in the world is this correlation stuff, right, or associations. But then correlation is still not causation, right? It helps, it helps, but we still cannot say that the one leads to the other, right? And now we are with causation. So causation is then implies that X is before Y, right? So X causes Y. That's kind of causality. And uh, you'll see later on why this ordering is important, because if we don't know that, right, and we change y, then nothing is going to happen, because that was not the course. Right? <coughs> so if you, want to, if you want to change the world, we need to think about what brings this world about. We need to think about uh, the causes that lead to the effects that we, that we observe. That's causation, right? So you already see how we need to be much clearer about these things than in our normal natural language we often are. So the key point here is coincidence doesn't mean association, association doesn't mean correlation, and correlation doesn't mean causation. Okay, now I have here these statements formulated in a way that they imply a causal relationships, right? So now I'm saying becoming unemployed increases the chances of young people to commit suicide. You see, there's sort of, I clearly signal what is before, right? In the, other, in the other scenarios, I didn't, I didn't make that clear. I didn't make clear which is sort of before, which causes the other one, right? Or in the second case, education at private schools leads to higher levels of academic performance among students than education at government schools. Again, I kind of make it clear that the one thing is before and it leads to something else. So I'm establishing a causal relationship here. Or children of divorced parents are more likely to start displaying emotional problems than children of non-divorced parents. Again, I'm making clear what is the cause and what is the effect. And that's something, you know, I don't know, just you read the news and look at what, uh, what, uh, what art newspaper articles say. Often, often they fall into this trap, right? There's, I don't know, there's a guy like me coming up with uh, some findings, you know, that 50% of the people who commit suicide are unemployed. And then the newspaper picks it up and says, ooh, unemployment causes suicide. Right? But that's not what the research says, because here coincidence was conflated with, uh, with a, an association first and then even more with a causal, causal relationship. So we need to keep these things apart from each other. And that's sort of an, a simple, easy way to, to, to remember these kind of things, I think. Yeah. You have sort of, things can occur at the same time, then they are coincident. Think of the eclipse, right? Things just align, the stars just align, but it's just a coincidence, but you observe them at the same time. At this particular moment, that's kind of the thing at this particular moment. Then things can be associated. When they are also associated, they are also coincident. So obviously, then they happen also at the same time. 
um, they can be correlated and causally related to sort of the, the smallest one of these. Okay. So these are some terms that I'm going to refer to now for the rest of the lecture. So think about where we started, right? We wanted to know how do we know stuff and then how do we explain stuff. So this is sort of how we came up with it, sort of the general structure of an explanation. We have uh, something that we want to explain, and that's our explanandum, and we have something that we use to explain it. That's our explanats. And in between, we have this fancy little mechanism in between. Right? That's sort of a story how we get from the one to the other. Practically, practically what you will see and what you will, what you will have is information at the level of measures, right? Remember last time I, I, I made this distinction between theory, propositions, and then measures and variables at the, at the lower end, right? And you remember how sort of a variable is a, is a measurable uh, representation of a, of a construct? This is what you have at the end of the day. You go out into the world, you measure stuff, you have variables, right? And then we call it what we explain, we call that the dependent variable, and what we used to explain it, we, use, we call it the independent variable. So we establish a relationship like that. And then, you know, we find, we find associations, we find relationships. Now I hope that I, that I made you sensitive towards this, this thing that we need to be careful about whether this is really a causal relationship here, right? So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to outline three threads to this. So we establish a relationship between two variables, right, our dependent and our independent variable, and now I'm going to introduce three threads to you why this might not be a causal relationship, right? Things to consider. First one is reverse causality. Second one is this spurious relationship stuff that we talked about earlier. And the third one are omitted variables. Okay. So let me get started with the reverse causality. Reverse causality essentially means that when two things happen, right, we know that X and Y are causally related with each other, but we don't really know for sure which one causes which? Which one causes which? And oftentimes, that's the situation that we're in, right? And again, that's sort of something where the, the media pick up on something and they tell your story, they tell your story, while you as a, as a, as a, as a person who attended this course should say, oh no, um, what are you doing? Yeah. For example, right? Let's say there's somebody who finds that children that watch a lot of TV are most violent. Yeah? This could be a finding. This could be a paper that a colleague of mine, co colleague of mine writes. And then the media comes along and says, clearly TV makes children more violent. Is that really the case? Well, we don't know. We don't know. It could as well be the other way around. It could as well be that maybe violent children watch more TV. Right? Both of these things would lead to this association that we have that uh, children that watch a lot of TV are most violent. But you can see where this, go where this is going because if you, want to, um, if you want to have an intervention, if you want to change something, well, it would lead to very different, very different intervention strategies, right? If you say it's about, uh, if it is um, the second thing that is responsible for this association that we observe, then, um, then forcing people to watch less TV is not going to make them less violent. It's not going to help. Because you have the causal relationship messed up. So that's often something that you need to question yourself. And the good people do that all the time. They always think about, okay, what about it putting it the other way around? Like maybe the relationship is causal in the other way around. That's sort of what we call reverse causality. That's something to keep in mind. How can we resolve these kind of things? Well, we come back to that on Wednesday when we talk more about research designs, but essentially time, time is your biggest ally here. Time is your biggest ally. Why? Well, whatever happened in the past cannot be changed anymore. So that's gone. That's, that's water, water run down the river, it's gone. We know that what happened in the past cannot be the effect of something that happens now in the present. Right? We have cause and an effect. And sometimes we don't know what is the cause and what is the effect. But when something happened in the past, when something happened in the past and now something else is, is changing, we know that what happened in the past cannot be the effect, unless you are a quantum physicist who, who, who I don't know, they, there these things are in question. But for most of our, our life, you know, it's actually time passes by 
and what happens in the future cannot have an effect on what happened in the past. Right? So that's, that's reasonable. That makes sense. That's something we use a lot when we do practical uh, social, uh, social science research. We look at time. We have longitudinal designs. We collect our data at different points in time for the same kind of people. Right? And then we look at what are the relationships across the time <coughs> Is there a relationship between watching TV at time point T0 and being violent at time point T1? Or is it the other way around, that being violent at time T0 affects how much, people, how much uh, um, TV watch people at T1? Right? So that's sort of time that we take into account here. And that's sort of why we, how we try to disentangle these things and why longitudinal studies are what I think, uh, along with experiments, the, the most powerful research designs that we can have. So we look at time. So this is sort of what, if, if that would be the case now, you know, we have the arrows going from up to down, right? While the dashed ones, we don't find them. We don't find associations between being violent at time T0 and uh, watching TV at time T1. This provides evidence for our, our uh, suggestion that TV makes children more violent. If it would find, however, if the other way around, right, that we don't find a relation between watching TV at yesterday and being violent today, but we do find it the other way around, that being violent yesterday is related to watching TV today. This provides us evidence into the other direction, that violent children watch more TV. Okay, so that's sort of time. Time, we can use that, but we come back to that on Wednesday when we talk about different research designs. But then you already get a flavor for how we, how we, how we use different research designs to, to address this kind of stuff. Another strategy that we have, or something that we observe, is imagine we have our dependent, our independent variable, right? Then our dependent variable needs to be capable for change. If our dependent variable cannot change, well, it's not going to be the effect of anything, right? Give you an example. Well, the sad truth, the sad truth, I looked up the numbers. Uh, this morning. The sad truth is in Ireland, when you are a woman, you will get 15% on average less salary than a man. It's a sad truth, and I hope that you guys change this. It's even worse when you look at the higher end jobs. Sorry to break it to you, but that's going to be 25%. Just for being a female, compared to being a male. It's a scandal. However, in this case, you have this relationship. You have gender on the one side, you have salary on the other side. Well, there you know pre, pre, for pretty sure, pretty sure that uh, the relationship must go from gender to salary. It's not going the other way around, because changing, changing gender is very difficult. It's not possible, but it's very difficult. But this is sort of one of the things where you look at what actually is, what can be changed, right? And what cannot be changed, and the stuff that cannot be changed, it can only be the cause, it cannot be the effect. Okay. So that's reverse causality. Let me move on to these spurious relationships that now most of you guys got right. So I'm really happy because that's, that's, that's such an exam question. That's such an exam question along with force of viability. What is a, a spurious relationship? Right? That's, you can, can bet on it. Um, spurious relationships. A spurious relationship means that two events or variables x and y have no direct causal connection, yet it may be wrongly inferred that they do, due to one of these two things, right? Either coincidence, or the second one being an unseen factor. Okay, let me talk about each one of these. So first about coincidence. We already talked about this stuff, you know, the stars align and something happens, and we, we think there's a relationship, but in fact, there's not. In fact, there is, um, in fact, that's just, um, just a coincidence. So, you know, um, a lot of the, of, the, of, of the wisdom in this world, you know, and now I'm going to have an example for you, uh, a lot of the wisdom in this world um, comes, you know, I told you last time about what you should, shouldn't do in your free time, you know, watch the, the Jersey Shore, but um, now I'm telling you something else, where you can actually pick a lot up of, uh, of, of uh, social science research. And um, I just came across a, a, an amazing book the other day that explained the principles of economics with the Simpsons. So there's a book called Homo, Homo Economicus. Homo Economicus. I ordered the book. It sounds fantastic. Yeah? If, you, if you are in economics, I can highly recommend it. 
But The Simpsons, The Simpsons, there's so much truth in there. There's so much wisdom. So I have, I have a little video for you from The Simpsons. So um, I need to unplug some stuff here. So I'm going to unplug this, and then I'm going to show this video to you. So hopefully this is going to work out. Okay, um, I think it's an, an amazing scene. Let's walk through it. Uh, what happens? You know, there's the Bear Patrol. Uh, we've all seen it. This show is running forever. And there's the Bear Patrol, uh, and Homer says, not a bear in sight. The Bear Patrol must be working like a charm. And then Lisa says, um, by your logic, I could claim that this rock keeps tigers away. And then Homer, how does it work? Lisa, it doesn't work. It's just a stupid rock. But I don't see any tigers around, do you? And then Homer wants to buy the rock. What is this an example for? Well, this is actually a spurious relationship. This is a spurious relationship. Things just as co-occur at the same time, but there's no causal relationship here. So that's sort of what Homer thinks is the relationship, right? There's a rock and there are no tigers, right? But, uh, but in fact, you know, there's sort of, uh, this is a spurious relationship because rocks are everywhere. So they are here at the moment as well. They are in the city and there are no tigers in the city. Right? So that's a spurious relationship due to coincidence. As I said, a lot of things just happen, right? A lot of things just happen, and, and you know, in one of the first lectures I, I mentioned, often our brain is not, not, not really good, not really good in understanding this, that some things just happen by chance, right? If you just try long enough, you, you find some amazing stuff, it's just by chance. And uh, one of the examples that I have with you here is now the birthday example. So that's another thing I want to play with you. It's just a little, little fun thing here right now. You know, it's really funny today. Um, take out your phones. And you know, the seminar groups are going to start right, this week, seminar week. There are going to be 30 people in your group. Now I'm asking you, what is the probability that two out of 30 people have a birthday on the same day? You, know, you, you guys, you learn so many useful things in this course. You know, I'm really telling you about the world. You know, all this stuff that you can tell people, you can amaze them at dinner parties. You know, and actually, actually, I would bet my money on this. Actually, the probability is over seventy percent. Over seventy percent that with thirty people alone, if in a room like this, it's 
off the charts. It's uh, 99, 9999, what not. Actually, in this room, uh, um, it, would, it would be even off the charts, off the charts that three people or four people have birthday on the same day. Right? You can figure that things out, but there you notice some things just happen. And there's no magic about it, it's just pure chance. Sometimes the stars align you know, just because uh, uh, it is, it, it, it's going to happen at some point and we're not really good in understanding these things. So actually, as soon as there are 23 people, I will put my money on it. So now you see here sort of this is a little plot I made, you know, X is the number of people and Y is the probability that two people have birthday on the same day. So as soon as you have more than, than 23 people, uh, the probability is more than 50%. So the story here is, some things just happen together by chance. Some things just happen together by chance, and that's, our, that's where we come in. That's where we come in and we need to be very careful and tell people who don't know that things just happen by chance. So we are all about finding the systemic components, right, and teasing that away from the, from the pure chance element that will, that will lead to some coincidence anyway. Right? But that can be a grave mistake to make, to think because stuff is coincident or because we even think, oh, this is so, this is so, um, so rare, right? Sometimes our thinking is just not uh, able to understand what is rare or what uh, are the exact probabilities here, right? So where the birthday example um, hopefully made that clear. So sometimes there's coincidence and that leads to a spurious relationship. Another way how we can have a spurious relationship is because of an unseen factor. We also call that in the literature, it's sometimes called a common response, a third factor, confounder. These are sort of different names for the same thing, names for the same thing. And where does the wisdom come from? I have another example for you from The Simpsons. So let's pluck this over again and we'll watch some more Simpsons. So again, uh, the Simpsons tell us so much about life, right? Um, what was the story here? What is the outline? So, you know, there's more tartar sauce, there's more tartar sauce on a Tuesday, and there are fewer accidents, right? And then uh, Mr. Burns thinks, oh, that's great. Homer made it happen, it worked. Tartar sauce causes fewer accidents. What is the thing here? Well, we have a spurious relationship. That's a spurious relationship. Now, caused by a third factor, by something else, Homer is in the kitchen, he's handing out the tartar sauce, so he's not responsible for the security anymore, which causes both people having more tartar sauce on their plate and having fewer accidents in, uh, in the power plant. That's a spurious relationship. Okay. Now I move on to the, to the third threat. Uh, for causality. We talked about this reverse causality thing and we talked about the Simpsons and the spurious relationships. So now let's talk about omitted variables. 
omitted variables means, or we call it omitted variable bias, means that we are missing something that is important. We are missing something that is important in our analysis. And as you will see, missing something can actually, or forgetting something to including something in our analysis, can flip an observed relationship around. So omitted variables means two events or variables X and Y are causally and directly related with each other. Right? So there's clearly the one causes the other. But there's also an indirect effect from X via Z to Y. Right? There's also something X causes something else and that leads to something else. And you'll see in a, in a, in a, in a minute um, what that means. And then forgetting, forgetting to consider that third factor Z, right, this indirect relationship, when we look at the direct relationship, Forgetting that in our analysis might lead to very wrong conclusions. Okay, I have two examples on this. The first one is on gender, gender inequality. So that's sort of a study. You know, funnily, it's so many jokes in this lecture that you don't even get. Um, there's, um, this is in the literature, this is called Simpson's Paradox. Not because of the Simpsons, but because of a statistician, Edward Simpson. He discovered that, you know, there's an article written about that in Science, if you want to really look it up. Essentially, it was a study that they did where they looked at the admission rates of males and female applicants to graduate schools uh, at the um, University of California in Berkeley, right, in 1970, 73. So that's sort of what they wanted to know. They wanted to know, do, do males or females get admitted more often to the, to the graduate program uh, um, than the other gender? That's sort of what they looked at. And that's what they found. So this is sort of the raw data. You know, they had around uh, 12,000, 13,000 applicants uh, in 1973. And they looked at you know, uh, how many of them were male, how many of them were female, and they looked at the admission rates. And looking at the raw data, you know, it looked, it seemed that males get admitted more often into graduate school. So this, this looked as if there's a bias against females. Right? looks like a discrimination against females. Males get admitted more often to grad school. Not only do they get more money at the end of the day, they also get admitted more often. It's another scam. At the end of the day, they also get admitted more often. It's another scam. Well, this is sort of, uh, because we, uh, we, we, we forgot, we, we didn't include an important third factor, this relationship here um, turns out to be actually the opposite. So what they did now, instead of looking at the total number right, of who applies to, uh, to, to Berkeley, they looked at these numbers split up for the different departments. Right, so here are the, the, the six biggest departments that they had. And then they looked at the admission rates for, for men and women for each one of these departments. And now when you look at this data and you compare this stuff, you know, now in, in four out of six departments, women get admitted more often than men. How can that be? Didn't we just, didn't we just show that, uh, that males get admitted more often than females? Well, it is a paradox. It's an apparent paradox. It's called Simpson's paradox. Right? So look it up if you want to. And Simpson's paradox tells us we need to be very careful about drawing conclusions about individuals from information that we have about a population. So simply because we observe that, they are, that the admission rate for males seems higher than for females, it doesn't have to be like that at the individual level. Also the puzzle or the paradox that we have here is it seems that male applicants get admitted more often, but when looking at departments separately, it seems that female applicants get admitted more often. Well, what is the solution for, for this paradox here? It's an omitted variable. It's something else, a third factor that we didn't consider. And the third factor here is that some departments have lower acceptance rates than others, and females at least in 1973, tended to apply to these departments with lower acceptance rates more often. So here you see the numbers. So in the English department, you know, 65% of the applicants were female, while in the mechanical engineering department, only 2% of the applicants were female. And the acceptance rates were much lower for the English department than for the mechanical engineering department. Now, when we look at the, at, the, at the data, and if we, if we plot it, you know, this is sort of now you know, on, the, on the x-axis, we have the 
dots represent the different departments, you know, and the, the percentage of women applicants is on the, on the x-axis, on the y-axis, the percentage of applicants admitted. Yeah, actually, now you see it's a, it's a negative relationship. So now the more, the more uh, females apply to a department, the, um, uh, the, um, um, that the, when, when more females apply, you know, they actually um, present women applicants, present applicants admitted. I was confused. So it's admission rate. So admissions go down for females. So what is the third factor here? The third factor here is now the department choice. Right? That's sort of this third thing. Now it's not sort of this, this thing that causes both, but it's sort of this indirect relationship that we have going here as well. And if you would not consider this department choice, the, 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 the third factor here, um, then um, we would draw wrong conclusions about the nature of the relationship between gender and admission rates that we wanted to look at in the first instance. So that's sort of why it's really, it's really important. It's really important to think about the, these, these other factors that might play a role here, these indirect effects that could play a role here, and then we want to include them in our analysis. You know, there, are, there are ways to consider that. It's practically what we do. We control for that kind of stuff. You know? uh, essentially, we look at subgroups like we did here before, we look at the different departments, look at, look at the admission rates here, and then we average them over all the departments. But these are statistical techniques, you know, like considering something in your regression, like, uh, like including some uh, more than one factor in, in your explanation. Let me give you another example, uh, which I think is also um, pretty striking and, uh, and important. So let's talk about uh, death penalties. Let's talk about death penalties and race. Death penalties and race. So there was this study, you know, in 81, they looked at the effects of racial characteristics on whether individuals convicted of homicide, so they were all murderers, blacks and whites, and they looked at whether they received the death penalty. Right, uh, sort of the data, I mean, it's also old stuff, but it doesn't really matter. Um, this is sort of the, the relationship they looked at, right? The race of the offender and death penalty. And this is what they find. So, um, you know, they, they, they looked at a, a white, uh, a white defendants or, you know, these are sort of the, the, the offenders and, and, and black offenders. And it seemed, it seemed, well, almost the same or a little, a little higher the percentage for, for whites. So it seems that whites get sentenced to death more often than blacks. Okay. Now I'm going to do something, something, something similar as I just did before with the admission rates. So now if you look at actually subgroups, now let's look at, let's now let's look at not just at the defendant's race, but also at the victim's race, right? So now these are the cases where the victim, the person who got murdered, was white. When we now look, this is exactly the same data. It's exactly the same data, but now only a subgroup, right? So the subgroup of where the victim was white. And when we now look at the data, you see that now actually uh, blacks get sentenced to death more often than whites. So now 70.5% of, of those blacks who killed a white person get sentenced to death, while only 12.5% of whites who killed a white person get sentenced to death. And now the really crazy stuff is when I look at the other subgroup. Now let me look at the subgroup of the black victims. And now what we see now is the same thing. Well, first of all, you see that, which is another scandal, well, that was 1973. Uh, fortunately, a lot of things changed. First of all, uh, when, the black, when the victim was white, uh, when the victim was black, uh, the, the, um, the, death, uh, the death penalty was, uh, was given much less than when the victim was white. So there was clear, clear discrimination here. But then on the top of it, you see that now for this other subgroup, and now let me compare these two things, for this other subgroup where the victim was black, we also see that blacks get sentenced to death more often than whites. So now when we split our, our data up into these subgroups, right? and there are only two subgroups, one is where the victim was white, one is where the victim was black, in both cases, for both of these subgroups, we now observe that blacks get sentenced to death more often than whites. But didn't I just show before that whites get sentenced to death more often than blacks? Again, it's sort of the paradox. It's sort of the same structure as the ones that we had before. It's also the Simpson paradox. Paradox here is that it seems that whites get sentenced to death more often than blacks, but when splitting up the data according to the race of the victim, in both cases, black gets sentenced to death more often than whites. What is the solution for this paradox here uh, to, to resolve why that is the case? Well, again, it's sort of a third factor. It's a variable that we omitted, something that you didn't consider in our analysis. And here it is. 
that whites tend to kill other whites. And killing whites is more likely to result in the death penalty than killing blacks. Right, so here we have sort of this relationship here now, that uh, the race of the offender sort of uh, has an impact or, or sort of their whites tend to kill, uh, kill other white people um, in comparison to, to, to black people. And that kind of leads then eventually to a, a reversal a reversal of the relationship that you observe in the first. So now I hope you, you, you understood that it's really important you know, when we see something that happened together. Well, first of all, it might be just coincidence. Second, it might be a real association. But even then, you know, when we imply some causality, we still need to be on, on edge. Right? We still need to be very careful to conclude what is driving what here. And there are three threads that, uh, that are outlined. So there's a reading for Wednesday. Um, and See you on Wednesday. Thanks very much.